March 6th, 1953. A baby was born in New York City. His mother worked as a typesetter, and his father was a soldier away fighting World War II. He attended public school up until the sixth grade when he was moved to a private school for his behavior. My whole childhood, I was a discipline problem. I was very upset and miserable. From a very young age, he had an interest in computers, reading entire manuals for the IBM 7094 at age 12. Most of his high school years were spent studying mathematics in university programs, but often to the detriment of his social life. Throughout his childhood, he attempted to keep away from 60s counterculture and ironically the culture that sprung from it. It was anti-intellectual and anti-science. It was, let's believe whatever seems like a nice story. They obviously didn't understand the idea of truth, and so, I couldn't respect them. That boy's name was Richard Stallman. At only 17 years old, he was accepted to Harvard. In his freshman year, Richard was enrolled in Math 55, the hardest undergraduate math course in the world. He also found something else that interested him, CSAIL, the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. This lab was the birthplace of hacking, and on these early systems, he went by the initials RMS. Richard left Harvard and decided to become a graduate student at MIT in order to continue to program in the CSAIL lab. Here at MIT, he found a group of friends for the first time in his life. These programmers would go on to be the founding fathers of hacker culture. In the computer lab, something was changing. DARPA decided to implement one of the first ever password login systems on these computers. Richard was furious. He claimed that it destroyed the charm of the lab's anonymous community. Within days, he had broken DARPA's encryption. He sent an email out to everyone containing their passwords, along with a request. Hello. This is your password. I recommend that since the security is so weak anyways, in order to preserve anonymous access of these machines, you simply change it to nothing. Thank you, RMS. 20% of users followed in his request and set their accounts to blank passwords. At its very start, these computers ran on software that anyone could view and change. It was all public, and people found bugs and patched them this way. Things may have looked bright for these young hackers, but this wouldn't last. Soon things began to fragment. Manufacturers began hiding the source code of their software so it couldn't be run on competitors' machines. Richard was once again furious. In this rage, he had his first epiphany. People should have the right to see what is inside their programs. A few months later, the creators of the programming language Scribe had added code to make the language non-functional by a certain year. These kinds of programs were called time bombs because at any time they could stop working. Richard's anger grew. Fast forward to 1980. MIT just got a new laser printer, but unlike the old one, something was different. On the old printer, Richard wrote code that would message all users if the printer was jammed. However, when this printer didn't have visible source code, he had to contact the company. They refused his request to release the code. This was his second epiphany. People should have the right to modify the software they use. This is when the hacker community split in twain. Richard Greenblatt, fellow MIT hacker, founded Lisp Machines Incorporated, or LMI. This company sold computers that ran the programming language Lisp. Greenblatt and his team ran LMI, and the rest of the hackers, led by Russ Noftsker, founded Symbolics Incorporated. Symbolics would go on to create the first dot-com website ever. For the next two years, Richard and his peers at LMI would mirror the efforts of Symbolics programmers to avoid them gaining a monopoly in the lab's computers. Through this trial and tribulation of attempting to copy Symbolics programmers, he came to one of his final epiphanies. Software users should have the right to share with their neighbor, to study and make changes 
to the software they use. The year is now 1984. Richard Stallman just quit his job at MIT to work full-time on a personal project, which was currently unknown to the public. Radio Silence. In 1985, he publishes the GNU Manifesto. This manifesto summarized all his views he had gained over his time at MIT. He believed that all software should have four essential freedoms. Freedom 1. The freedom to use the program for any purpose. Freedom 2. The freedom to study how the program works and change it to make it do what you wish. Freedom 3. The freedom to redistribute and make copies so you can help your neighbor. And finally, Freedom 4. The freedom to improve the program and release your improvements and modified versions in general to the public so that the whole community benefits. Richard's goal was to create an entire computer system that only ran software with these freedoms, as he called it, free software. He also would use the term, not free as in free beer, free as in free speech, to attempt to explain that the software wasn't only free money-wise, but freedom-wise too. He called this system, GNU. At the time, there was really only one type of popular computer system, Unix. Unix was not free, meaning it worked like you would expect usually, but nobody knew what it was really doing when it ran. GNU stood for... GNU's not Unix. It was time for Richard to get to work. He started by creating all the normal pieces of a Unix system. He made a text editor, a compiler, a debugger, a build automator, and even a license called Copyleft, which essentially did the opposite of copyright. It mandated that the software remain free. This was it, the GNU system. The problem was it was missing just one component, the kernel. You see, every operating system is many different parts working together, and the part that distributes resources to all the other components is called the kernel. But how in the world would they write a free kernel? December 28th, 1969. A baby was born in Holensky, Finland. Both of his parents were journalists. His first grandfather was a renowned statistician. His second grandfather was a famous poet. He had quite the legacy to carry on. When it comes to video games, nobody compares to Atari. I find in television more sophisticated and lifelike. Gentlemen, move over for my friend Vic. The Commodore Vic-20. In 1981, at only 11 years old, he began programming on his father's Commodore Vic-20. He began programming in BASIC, but even then he got more ambitious and decided to learn how to program in machine code directly to the CPU. This is an incredibly difficult endeavor for anyone, as machine code is very difficult for humans to read. In high school, he purchased a Sinclair QL, and heavily modified the operating system. He had written an editor, assembler, and even a Pac-Man clone called Cool Man. That boy's name was Linus Torvalds. A week after Linus's 22nd birthday, he purchased an Intel-based clone of the IBM PC. Due to his infatuation with modifying machine code, upon receiving his copy of Minix, a Unix-like operating system, he was inspired to create his own kernel. This kernel was initially called Freaks, a portamento of the words Free and Unix. However, one of Linus's acquaintances changed it in an update to Linux, after his name. Linus wrote his master's thesis under the title Linux a portable operating system. It wasn't until 1991 when Linus first encountered Richard Stallman. His friend Lars Wersinius took him to UT to listen to one of Stallman's speeches. This inspired him to license his Linux kernel under Richard's free license, the GNU General Public License, or GPL. This was a copyleft license that Stallman had created on his own so people could distribute their software under it. Torvalds and Stallman, together, represented the two faces of free software. The only time Linus ever added non-free software to Linux, there was massive community pushback. The tool he used was called BitKeeper, and it was for version control. After the community found out, Linus wrote his own free software replacement and apologized. The replacement was called Git, as in GitHub Git. Yeah, the Git that almost all programs in the world use for version control. I was at Agenda 2000. And uh, one of the people who was there was Craig Mundy, who 
is some kind of high mucky muck at Microsoft. I think uh, vice president of consumer products or something like that. And uh, I hadn't actually met him. I, I, I bumped into him in an, at an elevator, in an elevator. And uh, I looked at his badge and said, ah, I see you work for Microsoft. And he looked back at me and said, oh, yeah, and what do you do? And I thought he seemed just a, a, sort of a tad dismissive. I mean, here is the archetypal you know, guy in a suit looking at a scruffy hacker. And so I gave him the thousand-yard stare and said, I'm your worst nightmare. At this point, a fully functioning free system had been made. The government became aware of this, so they contacted Linus asking if they could put a backdoor into his kernel, which would allow full government access. He refused. The government wasn't the only group threatened, corporations were as well. Microsoft execs were furious that people weren't paying hundreds of dollars for their OS. Ballman called GPL a cancer, Alchin called it un-American. In fact, the war against this weirdly weaponized McCarthyism and trying to convince the public that Linux was communist? In recent years, there's been a lot of people clamoring to reform and restrict intellectual property rights. It started out with just a few people, but now there are a bunch of advocates saying, we've got to look at patents, we've got to look at copyrights. What's driving this? And do you think intellectual property laws need to be reformed? No, I'd say that of the world's economies, there's no more that I believe in intellectual property today than ever. There are fewer communists in the world today than there were. There are some new modern day sort of communists want to get rid of the incentive for musicians and movie makers and software makers under various guises. They don't think that those incentives should exist. It was becoming clear that these hackers were threatening corporate profits. People were starting to see free software as a safer, easy to access option. With the rise of music piracy as well, it was becoming harder and harder to deny that big tech was on the losing side. At the turn of the century, things began to slow down. As computers became more mainstream, less people began caring about what was in them. Linux drops in market share. March 2012, an NSA contractor moved to Hawaii. He had clearance to large amounts of classified government information. Fast forward to March 2013. He takes a new job as a contractor with Booz Allen Hamilton. He now has access to millions more private NSA documents. A few months later, he begins leaking these documents to the Washington Post. He flies to Hong Kong with terabytes of government secrets hidden in multiple different SD cards one inside of his Rubik's Cube. The Guardian and Washington Post began to hand information off to the public. Here's what they found. Verizon, Comcast, and practically all telecommunications companies were leaking user data to the NSA through Operation Prism. Fourteen countries across the world, including America, had been sharing their intelligence data with each other in order to spy on their citizens at home and abroad. He called these the 14 Eyes. Project Prism also allowed direct government access to all Google and Yahoo accounts. Additionally, the NSA had a system called X-Keyscore that allowed them to gaze at the internet history of millions of Americans. This system took data from Google Maps, VPN providers, Tor nodes, and much more search data from various sources. The NSA was also working towards cracking SHA-256 encryption, so this was obviously a pretty big deal. Who could have possibly leaked all this? Well, his name was Edward Snowden. Snowden was able to flee from China to Russia before America could extradite him, or even worse, kill him. He was able to leak the rest of his data to the press, and the NSA was under fire. This is the first time the public had been exposed to such information. Most people could not even imagine the breadth of these programs. Richard Stallman comes back into the mainstream. If you want to have the possibility of some privacy someday, you better join the fight now, because now a bunch of people are joining the fight. Now is the moment when you can make a difference. If you wait till the day you wish you had some privacy, and only then try to do something, well, that day you will be one of the few people doing it, and it won't be enough. 
You've got to help make a critical mass when other people are doing it. And that's now. People start to listen again. Searches about Linux-based operating systems and free software rose to their all-time high. Linux rose in market share. Things were looking good for hackers and average people alike, but they didn't continue that way. You may be wondering where the internet stands today. Did these people truly build a free world, or were their efforts in vain? Well, let's look at the facts. Over 2% of all computer users use Linux, but that only accounts for people's day-to-day -day systems. Keep in mind it used to be less than 1% for most of the 2010s. 90% of all cloud infrastructure runs on Linux, and more than 80% of all mobile phones run the open source Android. Practically all supercomputers run Linux as well. You probably use free software without even knowing it. VLC, Notepad++, Dolphin Emulator, OBS, VirtualBox, Inkscape, Audacity, Firefox, 7-Zip Blender, all free. Minecraft was actually based on a game called Infiniminer, which was free software. RMS and Torvalds are still alive, Torvalds pushing updates to Linux, and Stallman hating on every piece of non-free software imaginable. But at the same time, Windows is dominating in market share. Almost all video games are non-free, and people are beginning to care less and less. Did the hackers win? The answer is... kind of. They created a system anyone can use and do practically anything you would normally do. It's fast, simple, and doesn't spy on its users, but did they win modern public attention? Not by a long shot. However, the fight is not over. Because of free software, the internet changed forever, and maybe someday you'll make the switch yourself. Well, that was a lot. Hope you stuck around through the whole video and maybe even learned something. I just wanted to thank you all for the overwhelming support I got in my last video. The channel jumped to 1k in a single video, which is just unbelievable. Anyways, thanks for watching. Drop a sub if you want me to make more stuff. I don't care if you hit the bell or not. Peace! Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers. You'll be free. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers. You'll be free. Hoarders can get piles of money. That is true, hackers. That is true. But they cannot help their neighbors. That's not good. Thanks for watching the whole video. Last time, like 10% of the people did that, so you are so cool.